Welcome to Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Here's a question for you. What kind of person does God use to accomplish His will in each generation? Can He use people like you and me? Well, in our study in Exodus chapter 3 today, we learn why God uses certain men and women to fulfill His purposes, and the discovery might surprise you. As you hop aboard the Bible bus, let's visit with Through the Bible's President Greg Harris, who's got something for our prayer warriors to pray about. As Steve, one of the really exciting ministries that we have is the ministry to China. It is still the most populous country in the world. India is gaining fast. Mm -hmm. But uh, today, China remains the most populous country on earth. And we got a great email from a listener that I think just paints a a wonderful picture of the many ways that we try to make through the Bible available. So you want to jump in with this? Yeah, this is an email from Lim Ludwig. I want to thank you for the spiritual camaraderie in these dark times. I'm a foreigner based in China. I've lived in China for 18 years. The COVID-19 revived my interest in Through the Bible as the church I attend got closed, and I am trying to make use of my one-hour work commute. I, again, we've <laughs> talk, this is a recurring theme. God yes. is using COVID yes. in, in part to drive people to himself, and he's using Through the Bible as the road. Yes. I got to know about Through the Bible through my aunt. I visited her about eight years ago in Los Angeles. I was curious when she said she likes to hear the preaching of Vernon McGee. This led me to discover Through the Bible on YouTube. Dr. McGee's rancher-styled voice was very distinctive and sometimes reminds me of my friends in the United States, some of them in Texas. Greg, why don't you continue? Yeah, and he says, I I really love this statement. I'm going to use this. He says, thank you for being high tech, but not modern. Hmm. And and isn't that an interesting thing that he's caught that we're we're trying to be high tech in the distribution, but we're not trying to be modern in our presentation. Right. As as our chairman would say, slick. Slick, that's right. Or as Dr. McGee would say, we're not using gimmickry. So yeah. he says, thank you for being high tech, but not modern. You keep it simple. Thank you for starting with a prayer and reading letters makes me feel that I'm in a fellowship. Being a foreigner and Christian in China, I sometimes feel alone, especially in my walk with God. I'm not persecuted, but I do feel different. I try to obey Christ more and lead my children and unsaved family to Jesus Christ. I do not 100% agree with all of Dr. McGee's exposition, but I appreciate his back-to-basic, no-nonsense, no-sugarcoating approach with occasional humor. We need more of that kind of preaching today, frankly. And then, Steve, why don't you pick it up? Yeah, he continues, going digital certainly helps me as I don't have access to printed spiritual resources. I can't even find an English study Bible here in China. And in my opinion, this is the way to go as persecutions are increasing all around the world. Also, I believe radio is essential to reach illiterate people in many parts of the world. Thank you for the fellowship and keep up the good work until Jesus returns. And Steve, I just love it when we catch these little glimpses into the ways that God is working. This is not, when we think about ministering to China, we actually don't think about ministering to those who are not native to China. But Mm -hmm. one of the reasons we do want to be on all the digital platforms is so that anybody, anywhere in any language can get it. Yeah. And, and we're making huge strides in that with our new app. If yes. you haven't seen it, download it today. THRU through the Bible is the way you would search for it on your particular app store. Greg, why don't you pray for us? Father, we're so grateful that you encourage us in this work of giving out the whole word to the whole world and and the encouragement that people's lives are being changed in meaningful ways and in deep ways. We just trust you to keep doing that, and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now last time we left off, in the book of Exodus, where God appeared to Moses at the burning bush. And this burning bush represented, we believe, the nation Israel. And Moses turned aside to see why the bush was burning but was not consumed. And today, one of the greatest proofs of the Word of God is the existence, actually, of the nation Israel. It was years ago that the emperor of Germany I think it was Frederick the Great that asked his chaplain one day when there was a lull in business, he says, what is the greatest proof that the Bible is the Word of God and that proof you will have to locate in my kingdom? What is it? And without a moment's hesitation, the chaplain said, the Jew, sir, he is proof. 
He's the burning bush that ought to cause the unbeliever to turn aside and take a look. This is amazing that he has existed down through the centuries, here for about 3,500 years, from the days of Moses down to the present hour. He's been in existence. Uh, the nations have come and gone, and he's attended the funeral of all of them, but he is still around. And so Moses turned aside, and God spoke to him out of the burning bush. He had to correct Moses' manners. Although he'd brought up in the court of Pharaoh, he didn't know enough to take off his shoes in the presence of a holy God. And I'm afraid that a great many folk today get familiar with God. We have today a new approach, we are told. We must learn to identify with this age and adopt a new vocabulary. May I say, it's absolute nonsense. One of these hippies came up to me down in Florida, a cute little girl. In fact, she was beautiful. She had the beads and a burlap bag, it looked like, for a cloak. And by the way, several of them were attending the service each evening. And she came up and said, well, you communicate. May I say to you, you don't have to adopt their vocabulary. You can communicate. You can identify by taking your place as a sinner, alongside of them, they're sinners and we are sinners, and we both need a Savior, and we can all understand that. It's perfect nonsense today, and we have some ministers in trying to identify doing some weird things in order to do it, and they apparently are not getting the message through. I believe the message can be gotten through. Now, we find here that God has come down to deliver these people. And he's making it very clear to Moses what he's going to do and that he's a holy God. And when you and I approach him, we don't approach him with a hail fellow well met approach. We don't give him that pat on the back. That's not the way you approach God. And if the Lord Jesus came into where you are or where I am right now, the glorified Christ, we go down on our face before him, and I don't care who you are, you'd go down on your face before him. Every knee's going to bow to him someday. Now, will you notice, we're told here, God says to Moses, I've seen the affliction, I've heard their cry, and I've come down now to deliver them. And in verse 8, and I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good land to a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, and unto the place, notice that, unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and the electric lights. In fact, all the lights are there, by the way. And God's redemption always involves, it's a redemption out of and a redemption into that is redemption. God has not only saved us from sin, but he's saved us for a holy life. That is the thing that he's made, I think, very clear. Notice what Paul says in the second chapter of Ephesians, verse 5. He says, even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you're saved. Now, that's from Egypt, you see. And he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, he's brought us up and given us a position in Christ. And if you're saved today, you are completely saved. And you're saved as much today as you'll be a million years from today because you're in Christ. You've been brought out of Adam, put in Christ. You've been brought out of death and put into life. You've been brought out of darkness and brought into light. You've been brought out of hell, if you please, and put into heaven. That is redemption. It's out of, into. Now, God says, I'm going to take the children of Israel, and I'm not only going to take them out of, I'm going to take them into a good land. That is the salvation of God. That's redemption. Now, listen, verse 9. Now, therefore... Behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I've also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, 
and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Now, do you notice what's happened to this man? Forty years before this, he was ready to deliver them, cocky as he could be, almost arrogant. He went out, you remember, he slew an Egyptian and delivered one of his brethren because he thought they'd understand. And he looked this way and that way, but he didn't look up. He thought he could do it himself. Now God has trained him for 40 years on the backside of the desert and he's learned how weak he really is. He's learned that he can't do it himself. And now he's saying, who am I? I can't do it. My friend, now God can use him. That's the way God has to train all of his men. Have you ever noticed that he does that very thing? God had to take that boy who could slay a giant and put him out into the caves and dens of the earth and he was hunted like a partridge, and he found out how weak he was, and then God could make him a king. God took Elijah the prophet, who could walk into the court of even Ahab and a Jezebel and say that it's not going to rain, but according to my word. And he said, I'm not up to say anything either. Soon he just went stalking out. My, you'd think he was a pretty big, brave man, but really he wasn't. God put him out on the desert. That's where God trains this man. And out there on that desert, why, it was a drought. And he put a little stob down in the brook there. And every day he measured it, and the brook was drying up. And he could just look down at that brook and say, My life is no more than a dried up brook. And that's what it is. And when that man found that out, and he also spent a little time looking down in an empty flour barrel, and he ate out of that. He found out that he was nothing. And when he did, then God can use him to face the prophets of Baal and to bring fire down from heaven. Paul says, Paul had to learn it too. When we are weak, then he says we're strong. That certainly is a paradox. But now that's what God has been doing for Moses. Now Moses can be used. You know why? Because he thinks he can't do it. And now that he can't do it, and he knows he can't do it, God can do it through him. One of the reasons that many of us are not used to God today is because we're too strong. Have you ever stopped to think about that? We're actually too strong for God to use us, and he can't use us when we are that. It's out of weakness we're made strong. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the mighty. Here's Moses and Paul the Apostle, too. And if today you are willing to be weak and recognize you're weak and will let God move through you, it's amazing what he can do through a weak vessel. Most of us, now I repeat it, are too strong for God to use us. Now verse 13, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And this was something that naturally was a question for Moses. And I'm sure all of us would have had the same question. The problem now is the children of Israel won't accept me at all. And God had told him back in verse 12, he said, Certainly I'll be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people, you shall serve God upon this mountain. But the question of Moses is, how am I going to get them to this mountain, you see? Now notice what God says here to this man. God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto thee. Now, I think there's more wrapped up right here in this name than has ever been brought out of it, and I can't spend time here other than to say, actually, just a few very primary things concerning this name. It is that name that is called the tetragram. 
we translate it as Jehovah. It's been translated as Yahweh. How do you pronounce it? Well, it became a sacred name, a holy name to the children of Israel to the extent that actually they did not know how to pronounce it because they didn't use it. Do you say Jehovah or do you say Yahweh? Well, I candidly, I don't know what you say. And I haven't found anybody that can tell me what to say. And this is the name that he's to be known. Now, back in Genesis, he is the Creator. He is Elohim. That he called himself the Mighty God. But here he is the self-existing one. I am who I am. It could be translated like that. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you the existing one. Over in Psalm 135, 13, he says this, Thy name, O Lord, endureth forever, and thy memorial, O Lord, throughout all generations. Now that name is the name that's here. I am who I am, the self-existing one. The important thing, I think, for us to see, this is the name that is the name that speaks of the fact that God is, that God exists. All right? Let me read Isaiah 50, verse 4. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God the self-existing one, the one that is the creator, the one who is the Savior. And this is the one that I believe is none other for us today than the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he's to tell the children of Israel. Now notice verse 15, And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. That is the God that appeared unto Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. This is the procedure that he is to use. Verse 16, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you, and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt, unto the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken to my voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. For I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. I'll stretch out my hand. I'll smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I'll do in the midst thereof, and after that he'll let you go. The thing is here that God is giving to Moses the agenda. This is the procedure. He's to go first and call the elders of the children of Israel and to let them know God is calling and that he's come down now to deliver them. Then with the elders, he's to go first to Pharaoh and he's to break it gently to him. He doesn't say, we're going out now all the way back into the land of Canaan. We're leaving you for good. But we just want to go three days out in the wilderness to make a sacrifice unto our God. Now, he says, Pharaoh won't let you do that. Then he says, that will open up the campaign that I'll carry on against the gods of Egypt. And after that campaign, though I will show mighty wonders, he'll still not let you go. But finally... I will bring one that will cause him to let you go. And God says, I've come down now to deliver you, and this is the way it's going to be. When we get to the plagues of Egypt, we'll see it actually was a battle of the gods. I think this is one of the most remarkable things, but we have so many 
wonderful things coming up here in this book of Exodus. So let me move on. Now, after that, God says he'll let you go. Verse 21, and I'll give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. It shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty, but every woman shall borrow of her neighbor. Now, notice that word borrow. It's not steal. Well, actually, what it means is to take back wages. You see, they were slaves. They were not being paid. And now God says, you're going to collect your back wages. And that's what they're to do. And of her that sojourneth in her house, jewels of silver, jewels of gold, raiment, and ye shall put them upon your sons and your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. Just think of it. There were several hundred years of slavery. And God says, you're going to collect back wages for all of that. And I'm going to send you out of the land of Egypt. That brings us to chapter 4 here. And we see now the return of Moses to Egypt and the announcement of the deliverance to Israel. But Moses, he has a great many hurdles to get over and there are a great many questions in his mind. Now notice And Moses answered and said, But behold, they shall not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. That would be a natural answer, would it not? And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. Now that rod will become the badge of authority for Moses, because he's going to use it in many different ways. But now here is the first. He said, cast it on the ground, and he cast it on the ground. Became a serpent. Moses fled from before it, and I think it was a vicious monster, by the way. The thing to make sure is that actually there'll be no power in that rod at all. It could be an instrument of Satan just as well. It could be satanic. It must be used for God. It's just like if you've got a dollar bill in your pocket. You take that dollar bill out, that dollar bill could have been used to help pay for a murder. It could be used for prostitution, can be used for gambling, can be used for liquor, and that sort of thing. In other words, that dollar bill can become a serpent, friend. It's only when it's put in the hand of a man of God who's moving at the hand of God that it can be used for God, you see. This is a tremendous lesson that God is giving here. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. He put forth his hand, caught it, became a rod in his hand. A great many people say to me well, about television, it's of the devil. And you remember years ago they used to say of the automobile, it's of the devil. They used to say it of radio, that it's of the devil. Sure, devil can use it, uses all these instruments. Sure, the radio is of the devil. It can be used of the devil, but grab that serpent by the tail and help keep the through the Bible radio on the air, friend, and make it a rod in the hand of God today. I get a little weary of a lot of these super pious people saying, oh, that's of the devil. And they never give a dime to keep these Christian radio programs on the air. They never try to get a Christian message on TV. And they never use their automobile to bring some dear saint to church. May I say to you, Grab the old serpent by the tail and use it for God today. We need to do that. Now, God's not through teaching Moses these great spiritual lessons. We're going to see something else. And God says that rod in your hand will become an instrument that will convince the elders. And he says, and that's not all. I have another lesson for you, and we've got to save that one till next time. And not only that one, we're going to get next time. But I mentioned a day or two ago about the home life and the wife of Moses. And I raised some questions. And next time, we're going to deal with that. What about the home life of Moses, really? We'll look at that. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. That was great. Grab the old serpent by the tail and use it for God. You know, it's true. God can use anything to accomplish his purposes. 
If we can serve you in your personal study of God's Word, would you please get in touch with us? You can visit ttb.org. You can email BibleBus at ttb.org. And you can always call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. I'm Steve Schwetz. For all of us at Through the Bible, we're grateful for your company on the Bible Bus. See you next time. Today's study with Dr. J. Vernon McGee is just one step in a five-year journey through the entire Word of God. Come along for the ride, and you'll study both the Old Testament and New Testament, discovering God's great redemption story. Is this your story, too? 